a slight buzz, and you're going to try and. Oh, okay, so there's a, a fire. <laughs> a fire alarm. Welcome uh, to our third class of this semester. I'm Barry Bluestone. For those of you who are new, who's new this week? The first time. So we have a few of you. Glad to have you here. Um, I just want to bring you up to date on a few current events, and then I, want to, I decided I want to do something today, given the historic nature of yesterday. Uh, and I'm going to ask you a question before we start. But I want to just let you know again where we are and where we're going. Um, today is going to be a very special class because we've been we started off by looking at lots and lots of economics for the first two semester, uh, first two classes, and particularly last week where we had um, Professor Robert Solo from MIT and Lynn Brown from the Fed. Uh, today we're going to take a look at political and legal requirements that are fundamental to economic growth, and we have a very, very special uh, speaker for us tonight. Next week, we're going to take a look at um, what I think is probably one of the lectures that I like giving more than anything else. I have put together a, I think, a rather powerful presentation of economic history in the United States from the 1920s uh, to essentially the day before yesterday. Uh, looking at the kind of American history with the bookends of Al Capone at one end and George W. Bush at the other. And um, looking at the economy and how it flourished during some of these periods, we'll take a look at what happened during the Great Depression and see the parallels between what happened then and what we see today. And we'll bring that all the way up through the 1940s during World War II the impact of that on the economy, and then ask a very exciting question, which is, at the end of World War II, uh, particularly as uh, it appeared that we were going to, the West, the United States and its allies would be victorious, both in Europe and in the Pacific, most people were excited by this opportunity, but there was a small group of Americans who were petrified by it. Uh, they tended to be card-carrying economists who worried that at the end of World War II, once we stopped spending gargantuan amounts of money on the military, that we would fall right back into the Great Depression. In fact, as I'll point out, one of those economists went so far to say that within a year of armistice, in other words, this would have been about <clears throat> 1946, we would have uh, about a 33% unemployment rate, which was higher uh, then on the day that Franklin Delano Roosevelt took the oath of office on March 4, 1933. It didn't turn out that way. In fact, after a little rocky year or so, the economy took off in 1947, and from 1947 to 1973, we have the most rapid period of economic growth in our history, what I call the glory days. And as you'll find out, it was one of those rare times in which we not only had incredible economic growth, a doubling of real family incomes, but at the end of the period, income distribution was more equal than at the beginning of the period. Very different than other periods of growth. And we then went into a dark ages from 1973 on. It begins with the oil crisis in 1973. Uh, and we really get to the point whereby the early 1990s, most economists of note are saying that we better get used to living at lower rates of growth, no more than 2 to 2.3%. Uh, was the kind of uh, speed limit of the economy. And just about the time we were talking about the end of American prosperity, the economy takes off again. 1995 through 2000, we have the second Clinton administration and a boom in the economy, which is almost equal uh, at rates of growth equal to what we saw in the 1960s. And then we've had eight years in which the economy actually uh, more or less decline each year until this year where we have negative economic growth uh, in the last quarter of last year and probably for the first two quarters at least of this year. How did that happen? What was responsible for it? And we're going to introduce a single equation, y equals c plus i plus g plus x minus m, which you've seen already, and we're going to discuss it in detail. So that's next week, and Kathy Minahan will be back with us next week and we'll be doing that together. Week after that, we are going to have another extraordinary session 
Uh, this with Bill Dickens, who will be joining the Northeastern faculty this fall as a distinguished professor. Um, Bill was a professor at uh, Berkeley after finishing his PhD at MIT. He went from there to the Brookings Institution and from there to the Council of Economic Advisors for Bill Clinton, uh, back to Brookings and now to Northeastern. And he will be talking about fiscal policy. In other words, what is Larry Summers doing? And uh, Mr. Geithner, if he gets uh, confirmed uh, uh, by the Senate. And Kathy will be with us, uh, Professor Minahan will be with us to talk about monetary policy. What can Ben Bernanke do and what is he doing? And uh, are these guys doing the right stuff? Um, the week after that is going to be another stunning performance. We'll have Jerry Corrigan, who used to be the president of the New York Fed, and now runs about $150 billion worth of Fed money, uh, to talk about the financial collapse and what they're doing about it. Uh, and uh, he will be our guest of honor. And from then on, we'll go to taking a look at questions like immigration, free versus fair trade, the role of trade unions and labor markets, how does education affect economic growth? Can we have growth and a sustainable green economy at the same time? And we'll finish up on April 15th on tax day by asking the question, how are we doing? What happened over the last semester in terms of the economy? So it's going to be a good time. Be with us, bring your friends. We're glad to see you here. Before I introduce our marvelous speaker for the evening, though, I want to just take about four or five minutes and ask a single question. At 12 noon yesterday, January 20th, 2009, where were you? Anybody? In the movies. You were in the movies? What were you, who was that? What were you watching? Uh, Slumdog Millionaire. So you're in Mumbai when all the rest of us are in Washington, D.C.? Well, while you were in the movies, we, have, we actually inaugurated a new president, the 44th president of the United States. The movies. Yeah. Wonderful. Conference room at? At work. Were there other people with you there? Wow. There must be a great work ethic in your place. Where were you? We were at home. You took the day off. It was a holiday, two holiday days in a row. Right. right. <laughs> Fabulous. Cafeteria. I'm sorry, the cafeteria? Lots of people gathered around the television or something? Right. Well, the thing that I found extraordinary about it, and I have to tell you, I was actually with my wife at a, at a, at a local hospital, unfortunately, but we're doing fine, was we were actually in a cancer ward. And just as Noon was approaching, the clerical staff on the ninth floor at Dana Farber took their, their computer screens and put it up on the counter. So people who are undergoing chemotherapy and others who have all of these problems they're dealing with in their own home, in their own home life, gathered around these screens to try and see streaming video, which was hard to see given that there were two billion other people trying to do the same thing, <laughs> with nurses and doctors and probably the most diverse crowd you ever saw. It was a chilling moment when you realized here were people who are celebrating this great new day in America who are all kind of dealing with their own problems. And then, of course, when you saw groups like this all around the world, literally, I think the estimates were over two billion people, watch the inauguration. You imagine what a spectacular day that was. And then I thought about it for a second. I thought, there may have been no time, probably has never been a time, in all human history in which more people, in a sense, got together around one event like that. The comment, though, that I liked best was yesterday morning when I was taking my 17-year-old son, who was a junior in high school, to his high school, to his school, to drop him off before I came to work. I turned to my son, Josh, and I said, Josh, this is quite a special day. Um, isn't it spectacular that Barack Obama is president of the United States? And he turned to me and said, yeah, that's kind of cool, but that's not what's really important. And I'm thinking, what, you got a basketball game today or something? <laughs> and he said, no, Dad, the really exciting thing is Americans voted him into office. 
And I thought that for a second, I thought, that's a very perceptive thought for a 17-year-old, even on Amazon. <laughs> so, for those of you who were with us last semester when we looked at policy advice for the next president, and you saw the lead up to this, and you saw you coming through some of the late primaries and all the uh, election work and the, and the, uh, uh, the campaign, uh, this was the culmination of a historian time. But now, as the new president himself said, the hard work began this morning. And we are going to be looking at that hard work all this semester. Well, today, as I said this evening, we're going to be looking at this whole question of the legal and political frameworks for prosperity. Some economies seem to flourish, others don't. Why? Are there particular legal and institutional structures that are more conducive to prosperity than others. And with us, someone who I just got to meet today, and I hope we'll be spending many more time, much more time together, is Jeswal Salakuza, who is the Henry J. Breaker Professor of Law at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Uh, Professor Salakuza served as the Fletcher School's dean for nine years. He holds a degree in law from Harvard Law School and an undergraduate degree from Hamilton College, as well as a diploma from the University of Paris. He's been a lecturer in law at Amadou Bello University in Nigeria, a lawyer with a Wall Street firm, a professor of law and director of research at the National School of Administration in the Congo, the Ford Foundation's Middle East advisor on law and development based in Beirut, Lebanon, and the foundation's representative in the Sudan. This is a man who has traveled. He was dean of the School of Law at SMU, at Southern Methodist University, before coming to Tufts, transplanted from Texas here, uh, has taught at the University of London, the University of Bristol, in Paris, in Madrid, and in the year 2000, held a Fulbright in comparative law in Italy. So I am looking forward to hearing uh, Professor Salakuza and his remarks on legal and institutional frameworks for prosperity. Welcome to Northeastern. Thank you.